Secured in the cockpit of your multi-engine airplane, you're ready to begin your first flight. Starting the engines will likely be different than in a single-engine aircraft. Most multi-engine airplanes only use a key for the doors. The magnetos and the starter will be on switches. Follow the checklist procedures. When taxiing, you must remember that the engines are now out on the wings over the wheels. This will require you to use caution when nearing a taxiway edge and when cornering. The propellers could come in contact with an object that your wing would normally pass over. Taxiing a light twin can be accomplished using the rudder pedals and brakes. You can enhance the turning capability and save the brakes by using a technique known as differential thrust. When using differential thrust, you apply additional power to the engine on the outside of the turn, allowing it to pull you around. You reduce the additional power just prior to straightening out from the turn. Each engine is checked during the before takeoff checks. Some airplanes call for increasing power on both engines simultaneously to check the magnetos and propeller, while airplanes with higher horsepower will have you increase power individually on each engine during the run-up. The before takeoff checks should include a briefing on the actions to be taken during your planned takeoff profile. This should include planned actions for normal operations and those for the occurrence of an engine failure or abnormality. The important thing is that the decisions must be made before the takeoff roll begins. Reactions should be nearly automatic based on where you are in your takeoff profile. We will discuss this briefing in more detail later in the program. Normal and crosswind takeoffs will be performed much like those in a complex high performance single airplane. After completing the before takeoff checklist, set your flaps as appropriate and complete your final checks as you enter the runway. During this mode of flight, the throttles will be used together. It's a good idea to get lined up on the runway and apply moderate power to both engines prior to brake release. Ensure that the engine instruments for both engines are as expected. Release the brakes and apply the recommended power setting for takeoff. In most light twins, this will be full power. Rotate at VR. If one is not specified, rotation should not occur until five knots faster than published VMC. After liftoff, accelerate to your appropriate climb airspeed and set your pitch for your climb. When the profile conditions are met, ensure that you have a positive rate of climb and raise your landing gear. Set your cruise climb pitch, power, and trim when at a safe altitude. You will now need to synchronize the propellers of your twin to minimize the noise and vibration level. If your airplane has a system for this, your instructor will show you how to use it. To sync the props manually, set both propellers to the same RPM setting using the tacks. Fine-tune the speeds by listening and making minor adjustments to only one propeller control. You should find a sweet spot where the engines sound smooth and any wah-wah or thrumming sound is minimized. As you have probably surmised, a twin-engine airplane has four forces acting on it just like other airplanes. When both engines are operating, you have a comparatively large thrust vector, which is the sum of the two offset thrust vectors that we have been discussing. This gives most light twins a significant climb advantage over their single-engine brethren when all is well. A less intuitive difference in the four forces is the production of induced lift. Since the engines on most light twins are attached to the wings, there are localized areas of the wings receiving the accelerated slipstream of the propellers. Let's get back to your first flight. After you've flown around for a bit and perhaps tried a few familiar maneuvers, you will return to the airport. Descent planning in a multi-engine airplane requires a bit more thought than when flying a low and slow single. Cruise altitudes and speeds tend to be higher. Higher performance engines also require more TLC. Power reductions should be gradual whenever possible. Temperatures should be monitored and kept relatively stable. Arriving at the traffic pattern 
you will need to blend in with other aircraft using the airport. At a typical general aviation airport, you may be the fastest aircraft in the pattern. Do not use this extra speed as an excuse to fly an extra large traffic pattern worthy of a 747. It's often best to slow the airplane down and complete your initial before landing checks prior to entering the downwind leg. Once established on the downwind leg, verify that the landing gear is locked down and complete any intermediate before landing checks. You will likely find that things are happening very fast now in the traffic pattern. They will seem even faster during your first few flights. Fly the traffic pattern as you would in any complex airplane. Verify that the landing gear is down and locked after turning on each leg. Complete any deferred before landing checks once on final. Fly a stabilized final approach at the recommended speed. Work toward being stabilized prior to descending below 500 feet AGL. As the pilot of a heavier airplane, you'll find it necessary to anticipate any power changes before they are needed. The airplane will take a moment to stabilize at the new power setting. For example, if you are above the correct approach path as noted by this too light pappy, you would reduce the power slightly to join the correct path. If you wait until the lights are red and white to reapply power, you'll probably find two red lights in front of you when the airplane stabilizes at the new power setting. The airplane's inertia simply takes a while to be overcome. As you near the runway for the landing, verify that the landing gear is down and locked one last time prior to committing to the touchdown. This is the final over-the-fence check of the gear. The round out in a multi-engine airplane should be smooth but not to the point of a full stall. Reduce the power and apply enough back pressure to allow the mains to touch down first but fly the airplane onto the ground. Float will be minimized by the higher wing loading of the aircraft and the drag of the windmilling propellers. Maintain the elevator back pressure and crosswind corrections throughout the rollout. The back pressure will provide maximum aerodynamic braking. Utilize the wheel brakes as necessary.